This is also the spot where the buffalo lion encounter ended. It ended with the buffalo all out in this open area and the lions lying just beyond in the thickets, those three and Kuma lionesses. Let's see if we can get a better look at this little lapwing. Also it gives us a chance to have a little listen and see if anything spotted young Medeva. Unfortunately, Jamie and the Wendy are having some issues this morning and she's just popped back um, for Eugenius, or Eugene, our tech genius, uh, to try to figure out what's wrong with her. Uh, the, the Wendy, that is, not, not, not Jamie. And see if they can get them out on the road shortly. There's a pair of crowned lapwings here. I think they might nest on this nice open plain at Impala Plains. The second one is off to the right in the distance there. I'm just going to get hold of James to find out the exact last position of young Madiba. James, James. And a very welcome sight there, that cold front disappearing to the west of us. Scotty, uh, could you just ask James what the exact last position of Madiba was? Okay, copy, thanks. news uh, on to Scott and James. They have found those lion tracks again and um, they are back on the track so hopefully they do have some luck there. And they've just given me the last position of Yang yeah, Madiba which was somewhere in this block here. Apparently I should see some tracks going off the road. And they've checked the Arathusa boundary extensively and no tracks heading back that way. Obviously we've seen James and Scott meandering about on foot. And Sid from Illinois is wondering, are they safe doing that? And what would happen if they possibly came across uh, those lions or surprised those lions? So Sid, it is a very interesting thing and I think they're perfectly safe. Far safer there than walking down the main road of a big city. You're far more likely to be flattened by oncoming traffic than you are by a male lion. And Oops, sorry, my earpiece just popping up there. And it's very, very interesting because uh, on foot, uh, one would think during the day you are at more risk, and, and you are obviously at a little bit more risk. But so, 
Lions have an inherent fear of man. The upright, bipedal figure of man is the dominant diurnal predator. It has been for about 200,000 years. Uh, we rule the daytime. We're the only animal that's able to operate through the heat of the, de the heat of the day, and that's due to our thermoregulation. Being able to sweat and get rid of our excess heat is what enables us to operate through that time of the day. Lions, on the other hand, do not have that. Uh, and we have been around in the current form for about the same time. So probably around 150 to 200,000 years we've been in our current form as Homo sapien and the lion's been Panthera leer. And we don't mess around at night. We don't walk at night. Night is the lion's time. They are the dominant nocturnal predator. And we've evolved to avoid each other like this. And generally when you walk into lions on foot during the day, 99% of the time, they will get up and run away and if you do surprise them they can charge and quite often it'll be a warning charge well there's no such thing as actually a, or a mock charge people use there's no such thing as a mock charge it is a warning and what will normally happen is they'll maybe run at you and go blah, 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 and hit the ground and make a lot of noise and there's a very safe a simple uh, saying when it comes to lions a noisy lion safe lion quiet lion dangerous lion so if a lion is charging you and it's making a lot of noise, he's saying, go away, go away, you're too close, you're too close, go away. I don't want to, play. I don't want to actually fight with you, but I'm just telling you to go away. And, but as I said, 99% of the time, they will move away from you, run away from you, even sometimes sprint away from you. So it is a, a very interesting thing. Uh, possibly the, the biggest threat on foot is always uh, your bigger mammals, your elephant and buffalo. But fortunately, all of us have spent many years in the bush and have many years' experience on foot and know what to do in those situations. So that's why I would say much, much safer than walking around the city, probably much safer than uh, getting into a taxi or getting into other vehicles with people you don't know. So I feel much safer walking and I have don't worry about them at all uh, while they're out there in the bush. You're still listening carefully. You still haven't heard anything too much. Still checking termite mounds. So, we're going to cross back to Jamie. It seems like her gremlins have been sorted, and she is with something uh, even larger than our whole car. Welcome back, and I do apologize for our. Pre Welcome back, and I do apologize for our prolonged absence. The Wendy was having some communications issues, which did mean that I was presenting whilst not knowing that I was not being seen. But as you can see, Eddie Heard, originally following when we lost you, I've moved a little bit closer. Oh! So, the boys are just... to show you these wonderful Ellie's and I've repositioned just while you were gone and we've managed to catch up with the two young bulls that were play sparring a little bit earlier now we know that some of you may have missed it because of the stream going down and what we would like to do is just play you a short clip just so you can recap on what you've missed now that the two of them have decided that breakfast is more important so for now here is the clip and we'll be back with you with these ellies in live time in just a few minutes
and there you go. So that is what we were watching a little bit earlier. These two young bulls, probably in the age bracket between sort of 12 to 15 years old, and they're still with their herd, but they're getting to that age where it might be time to leave soon. So they're just right on the outskirts of the rest of the herd. The rest of the herd have moved off into this thick block, and these two have remained behind, and have been play fighting with each other. You could hear their tusks locking and clicking through the trees. And then the smaller one on the left games with us. I'm just stopping exactly where I am for now just because I'm giving these two young boys a chance to get used to our presence again. I just looped around so we could get a bit of a clearer view as to what they've been up to. And they have been highly entertaining to watch. You saw that clip of them sparring with each other. And they do it on and off every now and again before deciding that breakfast is also important. And as I said before, these do seem to be quite young males, just getting to the age where it might be time to start splitting away from their herd, which is why they're on the outskirts. But just a little bit earlier, they both stopped and stared off in the direction of where the herd had gone. And looked, both stopped moving completely with ears out. So obviously there was some communication happening in the elephant world between the herd members that we couldn't hear or couldn't understand. But they decided that whatever it was, it wasn't too important. They didn't rush off to follow it. But young bulls are always highly entertaining to sit and watch because they are just testing their own boundaries and their own limits. Very often when they are play fighting like they were, the loser gets a very embarrassed, rather unhappy look about him. And quite often I've had situations where he's turned around and tried to take out his frustration on the car. Not in an aggressive way, just in a, I'm bigger than you, look at me. Oh, the little one's decided to try again, I think. Try and push his weight around. I do know that this is not the best view in the world, but we are right in the middle of a monkey orange thicket. And if I push any closer or make too much noise around them, then they will move off away from us. And I don't have any intentions of disturbing them today. We'll just have to be content to sit and watch the situation play out and hope that they start to move towards us. Once again, we can hear those tusks clicking against each other. And the little one being pushed backwards once again. Through the trees. And the larger one emerges once again as the victor. I once saw two bulls of a very similar age sparring like this and you can tell that they play sparring. Just look at their body language. Their tails aren't swishing aggressively. They're not making any noise. Their ears when they approach aren't really open to the extent that they're trying to intimidate each other. But I did once see two elephants of a similar size difference and the smaller one attempted to reclaim the advantage. Oh, clashing again. The victor is just pressing home his advantage. Now that they have moved over there, I'm going to try and just shift us ever so slightly forward so that we can see them. It's just a slight gap up ahead. Hopefully we'll... Stop there 
and see if we can get a good view. <laughs> There's lots of posturing going on, but it's all playful. There's nothing serious about this. I'm just showing each other how big and strong they are. And then eating once again. Now I've mentioned that these guys are just playing and that I'm judging that just by reading both their age and their body language. For young elephant bulls like this, it's not going to get too serious at any point, although they could run the risk maybe if they've got a bit of a fault or a crack along a tusk, they could possibly break one off, but it is fairly unlikely. They're actually being very, very gentle with each other, considering the amount of strength each one has. Now, if they were adult bulls and must, the situation would be very, very different, especially over a female that's come into estrus and that they're competing for mating opportunities. Now, the older elephants, around 20 to 30 years old, once they have reached that size and strength, they can have seriously aggressive fights and they can do each other quite serious injuries. And I know that there is an elephant skull in Kruger in the Taba camp where you can see a big hole in the skull from another elephant's tusks and they can do severe injuries possibly even causing a fatality every now and again but for these young boys that's not the risk that they run all that they are doing is practicing for a time when they might need those need to utilize those skills I'm going to reposition now they are very much tucked away but they have relaxed a little bit to our presence and the rest of the herd is also slowly making its way in our direction so all I really want to do is creep forward just that little bit and then let the elephants come to us and obviously in these kind of situations you don't want to go driving right up to them and make a lot of noise you just have to wait for them to approach us and then they'll be much more relaxed and much more calm as they do but I am just going to shift us into a slightly more open position so that we can see them let's try and choose the least line of resistance here we go and I think if we play our cards right and sit nice and quietly we should get the rest of the Ellies approaching us and get a slightly better view. Here these two boys they're still tussling that little bit. Now I mentioned before that I've seen elephants of this similar size sparring like this before and the younger one's technique in that particular case was to climb up onto a fallen marula all well, three out of four feet off the ground using his fourth foot just to balance him ever so slightly and he stood there looking very proud of himself and very big and his competitor took one look at him and just extended his trunk ever so slightly and just nudged him off the back of the tree and the poor little elephant fell over backwards looked very embarrassed and slightly ruffled and then turned around to look at us as if to say stop laughing at me and although, of course, we have to be very careful of anthropomorphizing them too much, they can be highly entertaining that way, and they definitely have similar human moods.
very energetic. And it's interesting here that a lot of these skirmishes between the two of them have been initiated by the smaller of the two. And then he immediately backs off and goes to eat for a while and pretends not to be interested. And then returns to challenge the larger one once again. One of them, or both of them have adopted this technique where they, it's almost like dogs when they do that play bow, when they drop down on their front haunches and their front elbows. And both of them have done this to, I think almost as an invitation to come and spar. They drop down onto their knees or lower their backs. You can imagine that almost like puppies playing or dogs playing with each other and inviting each other to play. The rest of the herd is moving in dignified silence. Off to my right, they're just leisurely feeding. It is a very, very thick block, so we haven't got the best view of them. We are, however, quite close to the road now. And the elephants are moving in that general direction. Hopefully we'll get a nice view of them. Especially since they seem to have adopted the termite mound technique of adding height. You can hear the cracking and the rustling away. There's lots of birds calling around us, but Sharon, you've picked up on the fact that one of them sounds like electrical beeps, and that is the fork-tailed drongos. I'm sure that's the ones that you mean. They do sound a bit electronic. <laughs> Decided to lie down on the termite mound. <laughs> oh, and then being pushed around <laughs> by the other male. I'm trying to get an idea as to which direction these two are going to decide to move into. Unfortunately, if I do go crashing through towards them, not only will it disturb them, but they'll stop demonstrating this behavior that they have given us such a good show of. Anyway, it is the fork-tailed drongo that's making those almost electronic sounds, electronic beeps. And there's quite a few of them following this elephant herd and just picking up the insects that have been disturbed. Now, oh, what are you two doing? Which way are you going to go? So that I can pick my route accordingly. You can't see it too clearly, but we have reached a standoff. They both stopped and are now just staring at each other. There we go again. And this is just teenage roughhousing. Nothing serious involved. <laughs> now you probably didn't pick up on that or didn't hear it, 
but the female off to my right, who's probably the matriarch of this little herd, it is quite a small little herd, she just gave a bit of a rumble. I think she might be calling them. I just want to watch their behavior. There you go, you can see the rest of the herd moving around off to my right. And also in very, very thick bush. I was hoping they would choose to walk closer to us, but they haven't. They've moved away. And I just want to watch and see what the teenager's reaction to this is. If they're going to heed the call of the authority figure, or if they're just going to casually ignore her. Oh, yes, you are so big and powerful. <laughs> oh, you're showing off so much. There's actually a little bit of frustration here from the little one. Getting cross. He's <laughs> taking it out on the trees. Are you going to come and say hello to us now? Hmm? <laughs> now I know that we can't anthropomorphize too much, but that really was so human. It was a frustrated individual who had come off second best in the fight and decided that thrashing trees was the best way of relieving that frustration. Very, very cute. There you go, there's Forktail Drongo's calling. And a standoff once again. And I really, I think that the smallest one might have had enough now. But the big, the larger one keeps coming into his space. There you go, pushing forward again. I'm glad that we didn't reposition because luckily they have come are coming towards us. They're gonna come right behind the vehicle. Hey little boys. Now I've mentioned that they've stopped to eat a couple of times during these sparring sessions but some of that is also what's known as displacement behavior so trying to pretend like they're not affected by what's going on between them and that they're not paying any attention hello big boy now this big boy is definitely almost at the age where he's going to leave the herd and start hanging out with other young males probably around 15 or so, maybe a little bit older, and it's right at that time. I'm just making sure they're not trying to sneak up behind me, which they're not. I have mentioned earlier that I've seen quite a few young bulls like this sparring and although they are moving just behind us I'm not going to turn on my engine just yet because I don't want to discourage them in any way or make them feel uncomfortable the older bull is quite close to us nothing too serious but if I turn on now I'm just going to disturb them and they're going to move off but I did mention I've seen a lot of sparring sessions like this between young males it's very very common to see and Jennifer, you were wondering what would happen if their play session came straight towards us. 
And that's a situation I've been in quite a few times. They get very distracted and sort of involved in what they're doing and forget about what's around them. And I found that in those sort of situations, just a quick word with them, it starts softly and then if they still keep coming, then you raise your voice ever so slightly. And if failing that, just a tap on the door. And then I just tap my fingernail on the side of the door and usually that's enough to alert them. I've never been in a situation where they've been so distracted that I've really had to shout or start the engine or anything like that. And in those situations, you actually really want to avoid starting the engine. If they've moved close to you and they're comfortable and they're not really targeting you in any way, you don't have to disturb them with what they're doing. But they do forget, they do get forgetful as to what's around them. And they are a little bit clumsy. Now I don't think any in any of those situations I've been in that there would have been any threat to us, but it is worth just reminding them that you are a factor for them to consider. You're not a tree to be pushed over by mistake. there since we have got an okay view of him for now and I thought it was going to be a nice beautiful sunny day but it seems like the weather is disagreeing with that you can see the nice heavy clouds coming through must be the tail end of the cold front we've been experiencing hello big boy There you go, feeling nice and comfortable with us. That's why it's always good to let the animal come to you. Currently uprooting the monkey orange, which I couldn't agree with more. And getting hold of those nice, the nice sort of growth points at the base of the stem and some of the roots. Hearing crunching. Oh, itchy eye. <laughs> having a bit of a scratch first. He's also suffering this morning. I said to Brian earlier that my eyes were itchy from all of the dust and the pollen that's around at this time of year. And apparently this boy agrees with me. Crunching away. And they're fluttering on the left, and then around to the right was the bird that we were talking at, about earlier that's making those electronic noises. It's the fork-tailed drongo intently watching to see if he's disturbed any insects. Hello big boy, fluttering down to quickly grab an insect and then back up and he's used his feet and his trunk to uproot the monkey orange. See how dexterously that was done. So he's crunching away. 
Easy as that. Now, I promise you, if we were to tug on those plants, we would absolutely have not been able to pull them out. He barely exerted any effort there. There he goes. Back to his trunk right around. This one might be a bit tougher. Nope, not really. Just got one foot involved and plucked it from the ground. In it goes. Now watching him eat at the moment, it seems as though he's only really interested in the bark or maybe some of the crunchier roots, but he's just rotating that through. It's like a conveyor belt and there it comes out completely stripped. And so quickly, there's not one strip of bark on that piece that he just ate. He's completely cleared it. Just by using a grinding motion of his molars. They really are phenomenal to watch. Now speaking from experience, monkey oranges are very solid and very spiny. But his mouth doesn't even notice that. It is so tough. Kicking again, uprooting again. Here we go, that forktail drongo we were chatting a little bit about earlier. Now as our early bull disappears, he's busy crunching away at these monkey oranges that look thoroughly unappetizing. John, you've made the joke that they make them sound quite delicious. And there was a suggestion that James might even give it a try if he were around. So on my way out, I'm going to gather a piece of monkey orange, have a bite, and describe to you exactly what it tastes like. However, Brent has a juvenile fish eagle that needs to be seen, and I need to do some arranging of my comms. And I'll cross across to Brent and be back with you a little bit later. Welcome back everyone and I see you've been having a wonderful time with Jamie and the elephants and some wonderful sparring. We've got something a little different here. We have got a big bird of prey and it's quite an interesting looking one. So I think it's time to test our birders and who can tell me what this big bird of prey is? Oh, it looks like he might fly there for a second. but. Who can tell me what this big bird of prey is? And you can send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or you can use the hashtag SafariLive on Twitter. Quite an interesting looking bird. See, quite pale up, but it does have some dark 
marks on the chest and a dark lower body yellow beak he looks like yellow feet perched atop a marula tree Possibly not where you would be used to seeing this bird. Very, very pretty with a sky and a cloud behind it. So unfortunately it looks like the cold weather is following me around. Oh, there he goes. Nice camera work, Chandra. And off it disappears. So, I wonder if that is going to be a conundrum for you lot. Uh, what bird is it? Uh -huh, I, I know, but I'm not telling just yet. So, I'm just going to scoot down a little bit down here. We might get a little bit of signal breaker. But um, I just want to, oh, it sounds like we've caught ourselves a branch. There we go, we have lost our branch. Oh, it looks like I was thwarted by Jamie, who revealed the answer to the quiz in the link. And it was a juvenile fish eagle. So almost in adult plumage, you can see just still a little bit of dark markings around the chest, but nearly an adult. Uh, thanks to Anna Marie and Lynn who still provided the answers, even though Jamie gave it away. Uh, we will have to have a word with her about that. You know, it sounds like we still have a rather large branch, so bear with me for a second. I cannot deal with that noise of a scraping branch under my car. Um, I'm going to disappear out of sight under the vehicle. And, oh, it is a, a Dicrostachus or a sickle bush that an elephant has been feeding on and deposited into the road and it's now been caught under the vehicle. And there's one piece. And two pieces, and we can now continue in relative peace without that incessant <laughs> underneath us. So what I'm hoping is, as we sidle towards Sydney's waterhole, there might be some hippos trying to bask in what little sunlight there is. As you can see, I took my jacket off earlier and became very cold and had to put it back on. The other reason we're in this area is Taxon saw the female hyena carrying the little cub into this block TV, sort of south of us. So I think the new hyena den is possibly in here somewhere. Oh, there we go, another bird of prey for you down there. Have a look, that one looks a bit more difficult. Turn for me, please. Um, oh, there was a bit of a giveaway there. Really beautiful bird disappearing there. Uh, quite difficult to ID from that brief visual, but it was a tawny eagle. So, we've doing quite well on the predatory bird front this morning. We've seen a juvenile fish eagle. African hawk eagles uh, and now a tawny eagle. So maybe we should try to look for a Wahlbergs. Oh, nice warm sun popping through.
basking because I'm sure that the water is very chilly. It was very cold last night. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Welcome back everyone, sorry about that, it seems like it's a little weird signal spot there, but we're back. Uh, unfortunately we went past uh, Sydney's water hole, uh, there, were apps, there was absolutely nothing happening in that area. Just hang on, I've got Scotty calling me. Uh, Sandy Patch heading west, southwest. update from Scott and James, these lions seem to be flying and we're unable to uh, find them just yet but the guys are still out there and hopefully they, if they don't appear this morning they will make an appearance on the sunset safari and hopefully all five roaring and making lots of noise to make them easy to find. about predatory birds uh, and one I haven't seen on a live drive since I've been here but I know quite a few of you have on the Arethusa airstrip is, have seen secretary birds there and Tony from Holland is wondering does a young secretary bird learn how to kill snakes from its mother or is it instinctive? Well Tony I would guess it's a bit of both but I would definitely say mostly instinctive but there is possibly some slight degree of learning that happens. Oh, got chilly again. Sun's popped behind the cloud. Oh, we've got a nice little flock of white helmet shrikes. You got them on the ground, John there, there, there they go, a couple of them there, here we go, white crowned helmet shrikes, also sometimes known as the seven sisters, often in flocks of seven, I'm going to try count them now, um, oh 
Hold on, guys, I've just got a update. Um, about a possible leopard sighting quite close to where we are. So, hold on, Ferrari Safari. So there's a report of a female leopard, a possible female leopard, a, a termite terrier on Impala Plains. So um, hold on, I'm trying to get there. We don't actually have radio comms, we've ever seen it. It is one of the sort of supply vehicles or maintenance vehicles. Uh, so they're probably not going to hang around there. So I'm going to go quite quickly to get there uh, so we can get it. I think it might not be a female leopard. I think it might be a young male leopard. It also goes by the name of Madiba. Morning, morning. Just come down. We haven't seen anybody uh, or heard. Uh, that must be on the eastern channel or something. Uh, apparently there's a... Oh, Franklin alarming at something. But um, apparently there's a leopard on Impala plants. Yeah, no, we've just come all the way. Over. You've nothing, you didn't see it. Yeah, okay, well, I'll let you know if I, I okay. find something. Thanks so much. Cheers. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. A little morning meeting. Bumped into a vehicle. Uh, they've just come from there, they didn't see anything. Um, hopefully, Jean has eagle eyes and uh, my nose will find us that young leopard. So I don't think it's a female, I think that's a similar area where we were looking for Madiba earlier. And he maybe moved out onto the top of a Shiduru. And for those of you who are wondering what a Shiduru is, it's a termite bound in Shangan. anywhere from here uh, so we're going to be checking carefully all the termite mounds but we'll be doing it at a slight rate of knots trusting our superior bush skills to hopefully find this
carrying rabies or whatnot. But this is definitely not something we see on a daily basis. You might find even the two dogs might have tried to chase him and then pushed him into this position of having to, to catch one of them. And this is a first for me in the Sabi Sands. Um, I have occasionally seen domestic dogs that have meandered into the park. Uh, this is the first time I've ever seen a leopard catch one and take it up a tree. Text did he bumper? Bumper both. Just bumper one. The aim was coming that side and the dog was just running on the road. Surprise was just coming. When we saw surprise coming from the other side, we thought it's coming with the two inward. And when we get close, we saw the uh, dog and then. Uh, <coughs> So there's uh, quite a lot of giggles going on between the rangers and trackers around here. This is definitely not a normal sighting. <laughs> and this is a perfect example of how, how all predators out here are opportunists. So he has seen an opportunity at a relatively easy meal and he has taken it. I'm have you told the movers in the in the west? In the west? No, I tried, but uh, they were all bomba prior. I don't know if maybe they dig up. Okay. Sorry, guys, just any station in the west copying me. Um, if you are copying me, uh, we have Madiba has caught a domestic dog trip there in Junction and Pilot Plains. Now I'm gonna put my boy. So as you can see, the dog is expired now. It is no longer with us. He will feed on it. He will take an opportunity to get that meat. And Ginny's wondering, is this possibly one of his bigger kills? And um, I think possibly it could be. It's probably about the same size as Stenbock, maybe a little bit bigger, but definitely one of his bigger kills that we've witnessed. Not to say he's made other kills at different stages. It's a Torchwood vehicle text. Well, surprise was surprised when he found the, <laughs> the leopard with the dog and he's laughing very much now. <laughs> so, I actually am at a loss of words and that doesn't happen very often. But, um, So it actually looks like that dog is still alive. He hasn't actually killed it yet. I just saw a bit of movement on the neck. So I'm quite sure that the dog is very badly wounded, even though it is not dead yet. Um, I don't think it's going to make an escape from this. And I'm quite sure it will die from its injuries, and it's probably in so much shock now, it, it's not feeling anything.
So guys, it, it looks like the dog is is almost dead. It's probably going to die from internal injuries from those bites. Uh, obviously, this is a a very unusual sighting and not something we see often. There is a possibility that these dogs are poachers dogs that are being used for hunting and d domestic dogs like this are used all around Africa for hunting small to medium sized antelopes so Stenbok uh, and it is possible that they were part of a hunting party that have now that have now got separated or whatnot and and this young leopard has come across this there we go he is going in for the rest of the kill um, guys we are coming towards there end of the sunrise safari and I know for a lot of you who are pet owners this is probably going to be a very difficult sighting to watch and I think the dog is pretty much dead now and we have we'll have to call in the Sabi signs and obviously there are risks involved um, with domestic animals carrying diseases like distemper and rabies into the reserve so we are going to um, we are going to close the show shortly um, we are going to stay with us for the last few minutes and we also I'm going to say goodbye from Jamie and Brian uh, while we stay here with young Madiba and his canine prey So it's been great having you guys on this sunrise safari. It has been a bit quiet and those lions managed to avoid us for the majority of the drive. Um, and hopefully uh, those Birminghams will pop up sometime during the day. And I think Scott and James, after being fooled by them, will definitely try go out after breakfast we all will to see if we can find those lines and hopefully young Madiba uh, will enjoy his meal of dog and so I know a lot of you might be shocked to see the domest a domestic dog in the jaws of a leopard but it is quite uh, common occurrence in Africa, in rural Africa, that leopards feed off dogs, and it is nature, and it is part of living in the bush. And this dog is definitely from outside of the Sabi Sands. It's come in from the communities. As I said, it could be a poaching dog. It could just be a dog who wandered down the wrong road. And leopards are f frequently feed off domestic animals where there are people close by. So this is nothing unusual. I know it is quite a shocking sight for a lot of you. Uh, but please don't worry about it. Uh, it is nature and a leopard is an apex predator and it, it is an opportunist so it will take these chances uh, to get food. And well, young Madiba is going to be quite happy. He's got uh, some a meal for the next day or so. So guys, uh, we're going to wish you a fun day or night, wherever you might be. Uh, thanks again for all the questions. And we will see you on the Sunset Safari. Hopefully those Birmingham boys make an appearance. And we definitely will be following up on young Madiba again. So we're going to leave you looking at Madiba for the last few seconds. Uh, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day.